Well, welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Better Living Concepts Book Club. This is our Sun Food Diet Success System series by David Wolf. My name is Ryan. This is my wife, Janine. And we're diving into Lesson 9. This is the second half of Lesson 9. The title of the lesson is Origins. And so we read the first half of the chapter last week. We're doing the last half of the chapter this week. Uh, so it will be a little bit longer um, than our normal episodes, but um, a lot of great information in this particular section of the yeah. book. So let's just dive right in. Natural Selection and the Species Boundary. Returning back to the discussion of evolution, we find that natural selection, the primary agent of species creation under the evolutionary theory, is a tautology. It can be made it can be made to explain anything. For example, evolutionists claim plant mimicry among insects is beneficial and will be selected for, but they also claim that warning warrior colorations such as insect stripes are beneficial and will be selected for. Yet, if both these visions and movements characteristic of its class, fish follow one pattern, amphibians another, reptiles another, birds another, and mammals yet another, Embryologists have known for many decades now that vertebrate embryos develop along different lines which converge in appearance midway through the process, then diverge again until they finally develop in totally different ways. Similar organs, limbs, and bones. Darwin taught embryology was a guide to evolutionary genealogy. If this were so, then embryology is telling us vertebrates have multiple origins and did not inherit similar characteristics from a common ancestor. Are species real? Up until now, I have used the word species in its traditional sense, the way, non, the way neo-Darwinists have defined it for decades. Their traditional definition of species connotes organisms which can breed together. There are major problems with the definition of the word species. Pleomorphic organisms and all animals and plants which reproduce asexually fall out of the species categorization. This presents an enormous population of living things on Earth and an enormous problem for neo-Darwinists. How do we classify such organisms? Another problem with this definition is that extinct populations of fossils do not breed. So we do not know whether they could breed together and do in fact represent one or more species. This also can never be tested. And what of living populations that are genetically identical but cannot breed together, such as varieties of the fruit fly? And what of an offspring of a horse and a donkey, a mule, that is fert fertile, that is fertile even though most are not. A bull can be crossed with a bison to produce fertile offspring, and this also violates the definition. Even defining a species by chromosomal similarities may prove impossible. Italian researchers have discovered a strain of mice with only 16 chromosomes instead of 20, but Silva Garanga, Garagna, a zoologist from the University of Pavia, involved in the research has stated, quote, we have not found a new species, we have just found a new chromosomal race within the mouse species, unquote, from the San Diego Union Tribune of Mice and Scientists, December 17, 1996. When the definition of species is thrown up to the, wa to the wind, then statements such as all the species of Galapagos finch have evolved from common ancestors loses any value. Claims of new species forming within the present day continue to be asserted by neo-Darwinists. In all of the examples they offer, however, what we actually find are two types of situations. The first type involves blurring the definition of what they have defined a species as and replacing it with a definition so poorly defined that any subspecies variation can be claimed as speciation. The Galapagos finches are an excellent example of subspecies variations claimed to be different species. Jonathan Weiner, 
in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Beak of the Finch, describes researchers Peter and Rosemary Grant's observations that different finch species do breed together and produce fertile offspring. The second type involves chance mutations which, were, which the chromosomes suddenly double, as in plants, or change in some other way, but these mutations have never been shown to reproduce themselves into a new species. The fact that a species cannot be precisely defined disassembles the entire Darwinian classification system which relies on categorization. The fallacy of radioisotope dating. The vertebrate sequence, a reflection in rock, obscured by the ages, a frozen time clock. But how many years into the din dates each fossil we're examining? More than anything else, evolutionists do not like having their dating system challenged. The present dating system for organic material and rocks are so ingrained into the present scientific consciousness in the fields of biology, anthropology, paleontology, etc., that to, to, that to question their veracity is bound to raise emotions. As strange as it may sound, radioactive dating, the most crucial leg of the neo-Darwinian support structure, is perhaps the least scientific and the most flawed of all evolutionary postulates. Richard Milton, in his phenomenal book, Shattering the Myths of Darwinism, outlines the history of present-day dating systems and their flaws, some of which I have outlined in the section below, along with my own research. In the 1940s, American chemist Willard Libby developed the radiocarbon method of dating organic materials. His system was based on carbon-14, a radioactive isotope of carbon, uh, I'm sorry, of, of carbon-12. Carbon-14 begins to decay as soon as it is created at a half-life rate of 5,700 years. When a plant or animal dies, it stops taking in carbon-14 from the land and atmosphere, so the amount of carbon-14 in its body begins to decay, while the ordinary carbon-12 remains the same. All other still-living organisms, arguably Libby, argued Libby, still retain the same proportion of carbon-14 to carbon-12. This proportion does not change as long as the organism is still alive. Thus, it can be determined, based on the proportion of carbon-14 to carbon-12, how long ago the organism died. Hmm. Willard Libby made the crucial assumption that the total amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere has remained constant over time. If carbon-14 levels are increasing, the amount of carbon-14 the animal had before it died will be lower than assumed. The assumption will cause test samples to appear older than they actually are, causing inaccuracies. Also, the carbon dating system is not usable after 57,000 years because after 10 half-lives, very little carbon-14 is left in the sample to examine. Researcher Melvin Cook has also demonstrated that uranium, lead, and potassium argon methods for dating inorganic rocks are also severely flawed. Cook's findings have been supported by other reputable scientists in the peer-reviewed literature. Funkhauser and Naughton demonstrated the flaws in uranium lead methods by dating volcanic material known to have been formed in a Hawaiian volcanic eruption in 1801. The dating system showed these new materials to be three billion years old. Uh, see Funkhauser and Naughton, Journal of Geophysical Research in July 1968. In another related study, Professor McDougall of Australian National University found through uh, potassium argon dating ages up to 465,000 years for rocks known to be less than 1,000 years old. That was found in Nature, March 20, 1980. Mm. Most people do not realize that the four billion year age estimate of the Earth derives exclusively from methods of assessing radioactive uranium decay and the decay of similar elements. No other dating system presents an age of the Earth even in the ballpark of four billion years. The uranium dating system works by tracking lead isotopes formed from the decay of radioactive uranium-238. 
Uranium-238 decays into lead-206, which is distinct from common lead-204. The half-life of the uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. Thus, a sample of uranium-238 should become half-lead-206 in 4.5 billion years. From this relation, rocks are dated. The amount of uranium-238 and lead-206 in the sample are compared. The problem with this dating system is that lead-206 can be formed by other processes. While uranium-238 is decaying, it is also releasing neutrons which bombard surrounding particles, including common lead-204. By absorbing new neutrons, common lead-204 can be converted into lead-206. Uranium-238 and other isotopes are not metals in their natural form, but appear as water-soluble uranium oxide, which can wash from one place to another, thereby enriching some sites and depleting others, throwing off the dating accuracy yet again. The problem with radioactive dating is there is no independent means, outside of the radioactivity paradigm, of verifying the ages of the samples. Most rock samples, when dated, present a range of dates that appear as a bell curve. Along the curve, some ages are too old and some are too young, and ages are chosen subjectively, often because they feel right within the context. Consider the McDougall study cited in Nature. See also, uh, also see and compare Nature, April 18, 1970, uh, and a few others there where the scatter of dates conducted by different groups of researchers range from 0.52 million to 17.5 million years ago for a sample of KBS tough rock material used to date the age of the Lake Turkana man fossils. The dates for rock samples taken from the KBS tough were all over the place. The date of 2.6 million years arrived at for the KBS Tuft samples was eventually chosen to end the whole debate because it was apparently reasonable to the scientists involved. The assumptions behind radioactive dating cannot be applied to a system that is not understood within the unrestricted world of physics and nature. When you pull out the dating system and really understand that the entire uh, methodology for dating the Earth the fossils, and even the universe itself is flawed, then we may, perhaps for the first time, appreciate the incredible mystery of life. The Earth may have been here for trillions of years, millions of years, or thousands of years. The truth is, nobody knows. <laughs> Raw evolutionary diets or paleolithic diets, do they work in practice? If humans are truly carnivorous, then in the natural state, naked with no tools or traps and no fire, humans should be capable of and enjoying capturing and eating wild game and fish, worms and insects of all types, as well as eggs. Such raw animal food diets are promoted without any mention of restrictions or parameters of quantity. Instinctive eating is one such philosophy as promoted by the staunch evolutionist Frenchman Guy Claude Berger. Eating raw animal flesh is better than cooked animal flesh for a time and people will feel better until the body begins to accumulate the stronger unmitigated death energy from karma or the animals in the raw state of the animals in the raw state. This is why primitive tribes usually ate mostly cooked animal foods and did so with respect and understanding of the cycle of karma, life, and death. I have seen people on high concentration raw animal food diets over the long term and have seen lives sufficient, significantly altered by the negative energy of such foods. I personally believe, based on my experience, that eating a diet consisting of 10% or more raw animal flesh leads to or exacerbates major physical uh, psychosocial issues including addictive behavior, emotional imbalances, body odor, cancer, immobility, infertility, and parasite challenges. It is interesting to note that wild chimpanzees who include animal food in their diet 
mostly insects, do not exceed 10% animal food in their nutrition. Unchecked levels of raw animal food consumption seems to be associated with a poverty consciousness, a subconscious belief that killing, lack, and hardship are laws of life achieved by following the sun food diet success system. Mm. The sun food diet program. Ooh. Ooh. Origins. Wow. That was deep. Mm hmm. That was a challenge to read, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could have probably skipped over a lot more of that uh, because he really sums it up. Yeah. You know, yeah, he sums it up very nicely at the end. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What were some of the parts that jumped out to me? I will harken back, before you dive into that, I will yeah. harken back to the very beginning of this lesson where he says you could skip over this. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I understand mm -hmm. having read it now that it's true. We could mm -hmm. skip over that. And, I mean, I would encourage our listeners that if it's something that interests them to go back in, you know, read the chapter and look at some of the references yes. that he includes. Right. right? Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. So, yeah, boy, it was interesting that the burger's name was Burger. Right. <laughs> I felt that too. But, man. <laughs> That was something. Um, it's karmic. That if you're eating a lot of fish, you should test for mercury. Um, but, yeah, I think the one that jumped out at me was parasites rule the earth. They've infected the entire population and are bending it towards ever more chaotic dietary patterns so that their consciousness may dominate the world. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I was watching David uh, probably about a year ago. Mm -hmm. He was doing an interview. And one of the things that he was talking about was, this was a, a theory of his, that if you were to, if you were able to test the people who were running this world, you know, the elite, if you will, um, they would likely be um, highly parasitic. And thus, that's what his concept is there, that because they're parasitic, they become parasitic. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. So he really does go into quite a bit about the dating, carbon dating, and why mm -hmm. he disagrees with it. Mm -hmm. um, all micro, all micro mutations have to appear simultaneously and work together at every step along the way. For instance, the spine and bone structure are absolutely vital to every moment of the organism's existence. Even the slightest mistake or variance leads to death. Yeah, just a ton of stuff. Yeah. I appreciated the fact that he summed it up there at the end. Yes. You know, because that really is the the crux of what we just read. Mm -hmm. um, what it boils down to is that there, there's nobody really knows. Yes. You know, um, other than to say that the mechanisms by which they think that they are able to know are flawed mm -hmm. dramatically. Yeah. Raw plant food stands as the obvious primary food for human beings. Yeah. So, yeah, we could have probably just read the last two paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> we arrived on the spinning planet with a design to sub subsist mostly on raw plant food. And that is still our design now. Yeah. Yeah. So, exercises? Yeah, let's go into the action steps mm -hmm. for Lesson 9, Origins. There are two action steps. One, for more information scientifically and specifically discounting the theory of evolution, please read Forbidden Archaeology by Michael Cremo. Mm -hmm. And number two, exercise your skills in contrary thinking. Write in your journal ten statements that peers told you were true. These could be statements you still believe are true. After writing them all down, directly below them, reverse the statement and review it. For example, let's say you heard, money doesn't grow on trees. You would write down, money does grow on trees, and review it. Ask yourself questions. Which statement is true? Is one more true than the other? What are the short and long-term consequences of believing these statements? By the way, 
Cacao beans, raw chocolate, were used as money by the Olmecs, Mayans, and Aztecs, and they grow on trees. <laughs> Clever. Yeah, point, <laughs> point proven. Oh, that's good. Wow. So yeah, I think this is a chapter that well, I suppose we could have skipped, but it's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we read it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of this stuff um, I've already researched in the past. Um, so I knew a lot of it. I, I had come to some, some similar conclusions mm -hmm. in terms of um, dating things being flawed and whatnot, mm -hmm. but um, dating mechanisms being yeah. flawed. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's always interesting to revisit mm -hmm. the, the ideas behind all yes. of that. So. I like that he gives a lot of references. Oh, yeah. So that one can dig deeper. Yep. And it will be interesting to see how he incorporates this chapter going forward. Right. You know, we still have a lot of this book left. Oh, yeah. So it will be interesting to see um, why he felt it was important to put this chapter in the book mm -hmm. as we move forward. Um, I think we'll skip that last poem. Yeah. It's kind of a, a longer version of that shorter one that we read at the beginning of the first right. part of this chapter. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think this is good. We'll have to... All right. Well, um, lessons one through nine were really all of a precursor to diving into the rest of the book. And so lesson 10 begins with the toxification. Okay. And so we'll dive in there and uh, that'll be next week. And so we hope you all uh, will join us next week as well. And all this to your health. Yeah. Till next time. Bye-bye.